Now, Andrews will tell us about Sagittarius. Hi, uh, I'm Anders, and me and my collaborators wrote Sagittarius, which is a DSL for specifying grammatical domains. Uh, so first, I want to talk about grammar induction. Uh, grammar induction is where you learn a grammar, and it is a very, very, very old problem. It started in the 60s, so it's been over 50 years, uh, if I do my math correctly. Uh, where Gold asked and defined, like, what is grammar induction? And then some years later, Englund, who's kind of the heavy hitter in grammar induction, started asking questions like, oh, how fast can we do this? And then came up with her famous L star algorithm. Uh, and then there's been some follow-up work that does things like probabilistic induction. They discovered some limitations. Uh, there was eventually ad hoc format induction in the PADS project. And then since 2008, there's been a lot of recent cool work on using grammar induction for things like fuzzing, um, for things like uh, profiles, a lot of really cool work. Um, but it's got a long and storied history, and that is because grammar induction is very, very hard. Uh, grammar induction is not the sort of thing where you have a two, couple papers and you solve it and then you're done. Um, so why is grammar induction hard? Well, um, first of all, Given a set of examples, Englund found that it's NP-complete uh, to find if there is a DFA of size K. Uh, okay, well, NP-complete, who cares about that? Um, but even then, uh, let's say you maybe need, you want to find an exact, um, an exact grammar, and you have membership queries, and actually, unless you can break R, say, cryptography, uh, membership queries don't really help, and you often will require an exponential number of membership queries, um, although I guess if you break R, say, cryptography, there's bigger issues. Uh, and, and furthermore, in practice, uh, inferring even something this simple, uh, like just any letter repeated one or more time, takes 679 membership queries. And that also means 679 calls to find a KDFA. This is using L star, by the way. Uh, so it, it's really hard um, in practice as well. And it, it should be hard. I, I actually think that grammar induction is one that if you kind of give some thought to it, it is actually really intuitive that it's so difficult because the space of possible grammars is actually incredibly, incredibly, um, wide and non-deterministic. It's, it's hard to think about coming up with the correct grammar when they're so loopy, you know, they can each call each other, things like that. It's, it's not easy. So uh, grammar induction is something that is, in my opinion, um, both, I guess, theoretically hard, practically hard, and intuitively hard. Uh, so, so hopefully I've convinced you that this problem is hard. Uh, so Instead of addressing this problem, I'm just going to say, let's solve an easier one. Um, and also, I would say that general grammar induction is kind of under constrained. So my solution is to constrain the search space. So this is the general approach, is we're going to describe the search space with a DSL. Uh, we're going to contextualize the search space by giving explicit preferences. And lastly, we're going to induce uh, the grammar using some combination of semi-ring parsing and max SMT. So, uh, to do this, I'm going to do an extended example on CSV induction. And you would think, okay, CSV induction, oh, that's a kind of easy problem, right? Oh, let's look at this CSV. I could come up with that grammar. It's a number, a string, and then a number, and there's commas in between. It's just comma separate value, of course. Uh, and so I could write this. There it is. Look at that. I have generated the uh, grammar for this. I've got some strings and numbers that I'm not going to define here. I've got three cells separated by separators in each row, and a table is just one or more rows with new lines between them. Okay, well, actually, it's a hard problem. Look at this as one example. Um, you have, actually, if you look at it, it's not a comma separated value, it's actually a semicolon separated value. But also, if you look at it, it you could imagine that if you were a automated system, you might actually think, yeah, this is a comma-separated value. Look, there's, there's regular commas in between them. There's kind of two or three commas each time, so this kind of looks like a comma-separated value. Um, so, so it's actually, in my opinion, a hard 
problem, even just kind of in a basic way, and uh, it's made even more hard by the fact that real CSVs kind of stink. Um, namely, the delimiters uh, are either commas, tabs, or semicolons. It's, you might think, oh, that's not that hard. Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, you can have crazy delimiters. Uh, the quote characters are the quote characters, right? Nope, not true. Uh, the string delimiters are slashes, of course. No. Uh, and lastly, you'd think, well, at least they, it, they look like tables, right? CSVs have a fixed number of columns. Not even that is true. Um, so CSVs are actually quite difficult, and they're so difficult that there has been prior research work on how to do this. This is in the context of this thing called CSV or Angular and these Python sniffer libraries. This is the sort of thing that people are actively working on. So what can Sagittarius, which is our language, do? Well, we're going to say that you could do domain-specific grammar induction for free. Essentially, uh, rather than code up all these custom little tools, uh, Sagittarius will actually build a domain-specific grammar inducer for you. Uh, and this is really inspired by Sigus, which is where you kind of can describe the problem, and then, a, uh, in our case, a syntax-guided grammar induction engine will solve it for you. Uh, but before we describe the CSV metagrammar, I'm, and I'll do a whole, you know, work through the grammar thing, or metagrammar thing, I'm going to give a quick slide of formalism, because uh, I want to describe what are metagrammars. Um, I would say that they are sets of grammars, because I'm trying to define a search space, I'm trying to define the set of possible valid grammars. Uh, so we have a denotational semantics, which turns metagrammars into sets of grammars, um, and if you described using a intermediary semantics that's in indexed by a natural number k, uh, and that's with kind of a big step style semantics, um, and it says if mg steps to g, that means that it kind of non-deterministically steps to a grammar of complexity, which I'm not going to describe in detail, k. And this will be useful in their algorithm eventually, and the actual semantics is just the union overall k of the things that are set to. Okay. So, done with formalism, let's go into metagrammars. Uh, so for Sagittarius metagrammars, we're going to start with the problem of, hey, we want to figure out three column CSVs, where uh, the rows can be just numbers or strings, something kind of simple. Uh, let's come up with a metagrammar for it. Well, you know what? I'm just going to say at the start, let's just start with our grammar. And this is uh, one of our design decisions for Sagittarius, is that we look like grammars. So actually, this grammar that I've written is indeed also a metagrammar. Um, but there's an issue. Uh, this, this is a grammar that accepts three column CSVs right like this, where it goes number, string, number, but I might want to do something like number, number, string. That, that can't be handled here. So we need some sort of a way of kind of describing, obviously, multiple grammars. Uh, this is done with optional productions, which is expressed using these question marks. We can say that each cell goes to either, or it, the cell zero can have a production to number, and it can also have a production to string. Um, so we add these in, so now I say that cell zero can go to number or string, cell one can do the same, and then I'm also going to do a similar thing for separators to say, yeah, maybe we can have any of these four separators. Okay, that's kind of nice, uh, but this is a little heavy syntax, so I'm going to combine all these cell zero one twos into just a cell i, where i ranges from zero to two, uh, and then I've kind of expressed multiple grammars in, this, uh, in a terse way, just to make things a little easier. Um, but there's an issue here. Uh, this, this, this option parameter, these kind of questionable, these optional productions, um, this is not like a choice type of operator. It's essentially saying cell can go to and then I can have a production to number and I can potentially have a production to string. So I could have in this metagrammar, I'm allowing cell to go to nothing. I could choose to not include both productions. I could include just number or just string, and I could have a production for both number and string. Now, I'd say that, to me, in a CSV, I want to really have kind of well-defined data types, so I'm going to say that each cell can either step to a number or a string. So what I want to do is I want to constrain this. I do this with constraints. Um, I'm going to add in this little constraint that says, uh, that the productions of each cell i is going to be equal to one. So I'm just saying, yeah, we can only have one production for each cell i, which then just constrains the search space to be exactly either number or string. Uh, and I should also do this for separator, although I didn't include it for space on the slide. Oh. Okay, so 
now I want to step it up a level. We're not doing three column CSVs, we're doing n column CSVs. The format should be largely the same. We've got the cell i's. Instead of i ranging from zero to th two, I'm having i be a natural number. Um, and we have some complexity to describe rows, but you can really think of this as being rows of some given length. And then the table of that given length, that width of the column, is equal to the, um, what is it? Uh, the table of that length should be equal to the rows any number of times. So we start with the table and we ask, okay, well, what should we give to the table? You'd think, oh, it should be table of some nor number. I don't know what number that is. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to introduce the new construct, which is existential variables. So I can say there is some row length, which is a natural number, and you start at a table of that row length. Okay, so I've made that change. Now I have this existential, so we can say, oh, it can be kind of this arbitrary fixed row length, uh, and we've now actually described the full space of n column CSVs in this kind of idealized CSV. Uh, we have a little bit of complexity. Uh, we would like to generally prefer numbers because uh, kind of number, or strings kind of include numbers as well as other stuff. Uh, so I want to use numbers by default, so I'm going to add in preferences where I can say, hey, I prefer using this number. Pretty nice. Uh, and then we're done. Okay, great. Now we know how to describe a metagrammar. Now we want to do the other side. We want to do grammar induction. So how do we induce from a metagrammar? We have this high-level algorithm, which is we start at complexity zero. We search for the best grammar G, such that the metagrammar steps with complexity K to G. If a grammar's found, we return it, we're done. Uh, otherwise, just increment the complexity and continue. Uh, so what's the hard part here? The hard part is figuring this best grammar. So this is our induce with metagrammar and K and our positive and negative examples. Uh, so how do we do this? Well, what we do is we take this metagrammar and we kind of explode it out into this giant grammar that kind of includes all of the possible grammars in the metagrammar. It's just this huge union uh, as well as some preferences and the constraints. So we do this uh, extraction, then we use this giant generated grammar, uh, and we do a semi-ring parsing algorithm on the positive examples. Uh, the semi-ring parsing algorithm will uh, extract a formula that describes the necessary rules, uh, and we do the same for the negative examples, uh, although we will do take the negation of the formula because we don't want to include those necessary rules, and then we call max SMT to find a model that will satisfy all these constraints that we've done, and then we reintegrate those constraints into the metagrammar to get an actual grammar, and we're done. Uh, so we have a theorem that if there is a grammar such that the grammar is in the metagrammar and uh, the positive examples are in the language and the negative examples are not in the language, then we will find such a grammar. So yay, we're correct. Okay, well, so that's our full algorithm and our full, well, I didn't give all of the aspects of the DSL. Please read the paper if you're interested in more. Um, but what about the evaluation? Uh, we wanted to test in the evaluation some core questions. Uh, can we express a number of interesting metagrammars in Sagittarius? Are we fast enough to actually be useful? And can we enable better sample efficiency? Do we still need, uh, you know, 690 some examples to generate easy grammars. Uh, so to answer the first question, we constructed a benchmark suite of a lot of metagrammars ranging from things like states to things like email addresses to SQL, and we also did uh, three case studies uh, on XML, CSV, and SQL. Uh, I thought these were really interesting. XML, uh, we actually had this issue where the first time we built the metagrammar, we kind of built it poorly, uh, and we built it with a, in a way such that it had still a very wide search space. Uh, so what we did was we wrote, rewrote it a little bit, and we found that we could speed up synthesis a lot, um, kind of building up and agreeing with our intuition that more constrained search spaces are easier to search through. Uh, for CSV, while well, we did this extended comparison, and we found, yeah, we have similar uh, accuracy to prior tools, although we are slower than them because we're more general purpose. Uh, and then uh, for SQL, this was kind of interesting because it was inspired by uh, someone, by one of our collaborators who was in the industry and actually kind of had this issue where he needed to uh, extract and find the, um, uh, he needed to find the dialects of various S uh, SQLs and this kind of, this. Our tool, Sagittarius, was able to do that. Uh, 
Uh, speed efficiency, we're, we're pretty fast. We compared to ProSynth. Uh, the x-axis is time, y-axis is benchmarks completed. Uh, higher is better. ProSynth is a logic programming engine, so it's not built for grammar induction, but we can use um, the logic programming to do grammar induction. So we kind of compared to this and this with a few uh, added uh, benefits, and we found that Sagittarius, which is obviously built for the domain, performs better, as you might expect. Uh, we compared the speed, and we found that definitely the most time is spent in parsing. So I would recommend everyone should build cool, general, semi-ring parsing algorithms. I really would like these to be in sped up. This is where things could really be improved. And example efficiency, I don't have time to go into the details, but yeah, we're pretty sample efficient. Uh, so I would say for the core questions, we definitely succeed on that. For fast enough to be useful, I, I think we can do a little bit better. And I think actually this algorithm can be done a little bit better with better parsing algorithms. And do meta grammars enable sample efficiency? Yes. Uh, shameless promotion, I am hiring. Uh, I'm, me and Yupong have started a relatively new uh, PL group at SFU uh, in Canada. So if you are interested in a PhD where you do synthesis, domain-specific languages, uh, type systems, whatever, uh, let me know. So yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Please step up to the mic with questions, and our next speaker will get set up now. Andrews, actually, I had one question on the plot with parsing. It went by very quickly, but it looked like there was at least one case where parsing was not the bottleneck. Is that true? And what was happening yeah, there? Yeah, okay. Uh, that was in uh, XML. Uh, and this is actually a really interesting one. So uh, I guess if many of you, who, or those of you who've worked with Max SMT, you might have experienced this. Uh, the SMT and finding a satisfying thing is actually blazing fast, can do it no problem. But uh, Z3 can get a little, we use Z3, um, it can get a little bit hung up on really wanting to make sure that it has found the right and optimal um, allocation, so it'll, it'll, it'll find something. If we remove the max constraints, it finds it immediately, but it spends a very long time spinning and looking for better uh, possible assignments. Okay, thanks. More questions? Then all right, let's move right along and recover our lost time in the beginning. Thank you.